Good afternoon, welcome to another 8Push video with Mr. Paid for Barlow High School. Today we're looking at the end of the Cold War and we're going to start looking at the Soviet economy. The Soviet economy is going to start crumbling. By 1975 the CIA had established that the Soviet economy was not, it was not progressing. They could see that parts of the economy were stalling and that it was kind of headed toward ruin, toward a collapse. Ronald Reagan is going to play upon this information and decide to expand the arms race. And it's not just Ronald Reagan. The Soviet Union trying to get a warm weather port is going to invade Afghanistan in 1979. This leads to sanctions. It leads to the loss of grain shipments from the United States that were uh, organized and, and agreed to when Nixon visited the Soviet Union and China in 1972. He had agreed to sell grain to the Soviet Union, which despite its vast size and amount of land, was unable to grow enough grain to support its people. So, with Afghanistan, Carter's going to suspend the grain shipments, and you have a new arms race occur. And Reagan is going to ratchet up the rhetoric, and he initiates the idea for Star Wars. We saw, talked about this on the last video, but all these things are going to basically force the Soviet Union to increase their spending they're not going to be able to decrease it. Now, with an economy that had lots of structural problems, this was something they could not afford to do. Gorbachev and reform. By 1985, Gorbachev su succeeds to become the premier, and he is going to succeed several kind of old guys, and they go for a younger guy, he's kind of a reformer, and he comes in and he has some ideas of how to try and shake things up. He knows that the economy is in bad shape. He also knows that the arms race, which they joined the United States in, trying to ratchet up and develop new weapons, new missiles, expand their conventional arms spending, uh, that they can't sustain that. So he's going to come up with two reform ideas. Glasnost. Glasnost is kind of an openness, is what it translates to. And this is going to allow critical press. The press that might actually disagree with the party, not be just party machinery. That had not been existing for decades and decades and decades of the Soviet Union. Uh, opposition ideas. It opens, uh, it's, it opens the Soviet Union's citizens up to some exposure of Western ideas and Western marketing. You're going to see U.S. businesses start to settle in. It was very famous when the first McDonald's hit Moscow. Um, you're going to um, see with this openness, basically it's allowing questioning of the system that just hadn't been there. And this, of course, is going to fracture not only the Eastern Europe control of their alliance, but it's also going to fracture even the Soviet republics themselves, because Soviet Union is more than just Russia. Um, Perestroika is a market restructuring. It's trying to do some things to improve and reform the economy itself. And so again, this is where they're going to allow some Western businesses in and try, you know, they're late to the party. The Chinese actually realized they had to do this by 1978, 1979. They started issuing market reforms into China, but it's going to be a painful, slow process. Well, by allowing some market reforms and more interaction with the international community, by allowing Western ideas and media in a little bit, opposition media, this is going to allow people to be critical of the government, and this is an explosion of pent-up frustrations that you basically were risking your life or your liberty, or both, to try and express before this. So, um, arms reduction. Gorbachev is going to meet in three summits with uh, Reagan, and he is going to agree to eliminate medium-range uh, intermediate missiles that are nuclear-tipped, and later on, we'll see that he agrees to one treaty with Bush also called the Star Treaty. And this is going to eliminate even more missiles. Now, these are just kind of a drop in the bucket. You're not eliminating 50% or something. It's a smaller percentage, but it's a huge step forward. And tensions are dropping dramatically when this is going on. Also, there's an acknowledgement on the part of the Soviet Union that what is that buffer zone in Eastern Europe for? No one's looking to invade them. They have nuclear missiles. They're not going to get invaded. They don't need the buffer zone. So spending mass amounts of money defending the Warsaw Pact and the Iron Curtain area, not helpful. Afghanistan, it's a drag economically on them. By the time you get to the end of the 1980s, you're going to see 
The Warsaw Pact collapses. We'll illustrate here in a second. They're going to withdraw from Afghanistan. Uh, Gorbachev is going to dramatically decrease the amount of military spending, and he's going to be eager to do these uh, weapon elimination program agreements with the United States. So here we go. Poland. Poland is going to be first in 1989, and they, 1989 is the year for the end of the Cold War in general, uh, or at least the major start and the, the major action of that. Poland is going to have a solidarity movement. It's like a workers united movement against communist control, against being totally controlled. Up here on the map you can see here's Poland. And Poland um, it has a five because it's the fifth item on the agenda here, so that kind of helps you understand what we're doing. Uh, here's a picture of Gorbachev. I guess I didn't really introduce him. There's Mikhail. Um, Poland, though, when they start, they have an election where they actually have an opposition party. This never happened. The communists were the only party. They had the only media, and they had total control of everything. This is kind of 1984, uh, the book, if you're familiar with that. Opposition party actually wins seats in the legislature. They win votes. They're allowed to be a, a presence. And everyone thinks, well, now the workers start challenging things, and you have protests, and they've had an election where there's anti-communist candidates picking up momentum and winning seats. Everyone expects they're going to come in and crush them with the tanks like they had in Hungary in the past and Czechoslovakia in the past, but they don't. And this is the signal that this is part of Glasnost. They're not going, the alliance doesn't matter that much to them. They signal that these countries are on their own now and they're not going to have Soviet uh, control and Soviet support of the communist regimes. And so they're all going to fall. They just come tumbling down. Opposition party, eventually Poland is going to break through. Berlin, when um, East Berlin loses their support, um, you're going to see that this, basically their troops are going to allow the gates open at the Berlin Wall. Everything quickly collapses. West Berliners and even East Berliners are going to start tearing down the wall. Um, and, you know, it becomes something sold at Nordstrom. Talk about a triumph of capitalism over uh, a command economy. You're going to see the chunks of this, the greatest symbol of the Cold War and the Iron Curtain sold off uh, at Nordstrom's. I remember seeing it when I was younger in 1989. Okay, uh, they made fine Christmas presents for a lot of people, I'm sure. All right, Czechoslovakia, likewise, they're going to challenge the government. The Soviets aren't supporting it. And all these people who have been oppressed for 45 years now become emboldened and start attacking, basically, these governments. And it doesn't even mean, they're often bloodless revolutions, but just criticizing them, challenging them politically. Um, Romania, they had a, the most brutal dictator of the Eastern European communist regimes, Nikolai uh, Ceausescu, and he and his wife are going to be tried and executed most of these are bloodless revolutions. Sometimes the communists fled. Sometimes the communists are going to be jailed themselves. Uh, but you're going to see the triumph of democracy in Eastern Europe. Uh, oh, in terms of where we're at on the map, uh, East Germany we've got right up here, Czechoslovakia here, which it'll split into Czech Republic, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Uh, you're going to have uh, Romania's down here. The former Yugoslavia is going to dissolve and when that happens, um, you're going to have a bunch of conflict break out in the early 1990s between these, these groups. And this is one of the consequences of having these two superpowers control everything. Remember, they were bribing people throughout the Cold War um, th with weapons programs and aid to be on their side. Like the Aswan Dam that uh, Nasser wanted to get built in Egypt. He's trying to get kind of a bidding war between the U.S. and Soviet Union. I'll ally with whoever gets me the most money to build my dam. Uh, and have hydroelectricity and control the Nile and all that stuff. Well, when the Soviet control disappears from Eastern Europe, that you know that allows some of these countries, you know, peacefully, the Czech Republic and Slo Slovakia are going to separate. But you have all these groups that have hated each other for many centuries, many centuries. Once the authoritarian power that was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and then controlled by uh, groups during World War II, and then by the Communists during, in Russia, Soviet Union during the Cold War. Now they're totally free on their own. Genocide is going to break out. It's crazy in the former Yugoslavia. Um, so all of these things happened in 1989 and the beginning of 1990. And, I mean, everyone's rejoicing. It was such an exciting time. I remember thinking, wow, this is just the end of kind of some of these dangers. Now, we're going to talk in the last podcast about new dangers that replace it, Middle East-based things. But... The attempted coup, 
Um, hardliners attempt to get Gorbachev to sign over control, and they don't like the direction things are going. And the Glasnost has definitely allowed some of these former Soviet republics, some of them I've featured here, Belarus and Ukraine, they're wanting to talk about breaking off. And they launch a coup and basically place Gorbachev under house arrest when he refuses to sign over powers and re, you know, basically allow them to take control of the government. But then Boris Yeltsin, who's kind of the president of the Russian Republic, he's going to stand up. The people stand up against it. The republics are all rebelling and breaking off. The Soviet Union itself collapses. Even though Gorbachev tried to save it through reform, it ends up collapsing. But, I mean, really, he takes steps that really made this all possible. And... That's how the Cold War essentially ends. Our last podcast will look at the post-Cold War world. That's all the time we have for today. Stay classy, Sam Barlow.